and namaste greetings from the temple city on behalf of the indian academy of neurology it's my privilege and honor to be the host for today's iin talk show this is dr s meenakshi sundaram apollo hospitals from the city of madurai which is famous for three things number one goddess meenakshi the presiding deity at her magnificent temple two madurai is a heartland for tamil one of the oldest languages of civilization and three we all know is none other than professor dr k shrinivasan affectionately called by all of us as dr ks who was born here and he continues to weave his magic in the field of neurology professor dr ks emeritus professor of neurology government rajaji hospital madurai tamil nadu a born legend lucky are people like me who had the fortune of being tutored by him as a student then mentored constantly guided and now continue to be encouraged and blessed i must say let's go to a legend and like ramayan that starts with balkan let's start from his childhood by the way friends i must inform you professor dr ks is very young at his heart he is only 88 years old having been born in 1934 started his schooling from ramnadapuram and then his junior college from st joseph college trichirapalli so let's start from there and having known sir i must tell you with your witty comments i know i am for sure that you were a very naughty boy in your childhood tell me sir about your childhood days and let's hear from you welcome to our show sir <coughs> <coughs> thank you dr sms and dr ums and the iim group which is kind enough to consider me as one of the indian senior neurologists thank you once again i think i have nothing much to say about my childhood i was like any other child reliable on some days unreliable on other days but made some progress in education and did not fail in classes and used to reach the college as the first of rank in our high school and so on but so i have to tell you about that i was really i was in pulkota which was then before the independence day so it was managed by the maharaja who came in a horse and gave us some coins peculiar to the, our state and blessed us all so i have grown from state root to indian constitution later on and i, I recall with affection all those days i have nothing more to say about a younger age but i just reached st joseph's college after a school final sir thank you very much so how did you reach medicine so what inspired you to go into the medicine field sir in those school days no medicine um, was easier to access in those days with very little competition all that we have to I was fine at rupees to buy the application form even that was not available with the meager salary your parents get in those days but then otherwise medicine was accessible it's not highly competitive as you see today with lakhs of students fighting for a few seats so it was easy but then it was a choice based on our liking for human suffering or what you suffered i was having enteric fever with mosquito bites for 3 weeks without chloramycin and no real medicine to treat it i suffered all the shocks and so on so i realized that suffering has to be reduced by better knowledge there is some clue to my future i don't think i took it of any predominant interest not that i hated engineering or other faculties not that i loved medicine too much but it was a choice so we know you for too long to believe this because we know you as a legend who has made his mark in neurology and medicine and i am sure any entrance exam of today even if you have to write today i am sure you'll be the topper in the country we know that about that sir so anyway thank you sir that's awesome isn't it so let's now talk about your early days in the medical profession professor dr ks completed his mbbs from stanley medical college madras and then did his md in medicine in 1961 from the same college 
He did his DM in neurology in 1969. He completed this. And around the same time, he did his fellowship in the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square, London. That is his very fond days, I must say. Let's come back to that later. And subsequently, he also did his PhD in neurology, 1980. And then he had FRCP from two places, Edinburgh and Glasgow. And then FAMS in 1980s, stupendous achievements, I must say. Sir, we all know you as a teacher. Rather, I must say you're not just a teacher, but teacher of teachers. But here are your student days in medicine. Hardly anyone knows about you as a student of medicine and neurology. So let us hear from you. What brought you particularly to neurology, sir? Tell us about yourself as a student and also just tell us, about your own teachers? <clears throat> well, at Stanley, we had all the giants of Tamil Nadu medical field. Many of them moved to GH later on, General Hospital later on, because it was considered as a promotion. Some of them worked in Madurai, then promoted to Chennai, and then promoted to GH in the hierarchy. And I had some of the best teachers to teach me medicine. And I, in fact, medicine is overwhelming. General knowledge in medicine is vital for survival of the patient and survival of the neurologist. And I learned this very early. And I was good to be an assistant even to three professors, very dependable with night duties and patient care. So I became popular that way. And I think government hospitals in Tamil Nadu teach you more than any textbook or internet, provided you stay in the hospital for at least five hours a day with a good teacher to guide you and a patients' florid symptoms to teach you further and further. So that was how I learned. And I think all my teachers were superb and uh, taught us simple bedside clinical medicine and with very few investigations. And, and that's what made us better scientists or neurologists in the future. Sir, let's also hear something about your skills in, you know, case sheet writing. You always used to inspire us with a very detailed note and you always used to tell us that you inspired your teachers. They became dependent on you because of your case sheet writing capacity. Just let us hear something about that too, sir, if possible. Yes. They, in fact, um, write a case sheet, you must examine the case patient properly. Be obedient to your superiors. Be of service to superiors and not give wrong information. And therefore, in fact, I should tell you, I wrote many cases for Professor B. R. M. B. Ramamurthy in Institute of Neurology, Madras, later on. Entire cases used to be written maybe without the final diagnosis, which was his right to make, make it or modify it. And uh, during writing the case, we have responsibility and also very detailed analysis. And I also used to carry the full set for medical examination, including ophthalmoscope, stethoscope, of course, the hammer, and uh, ice water for caloric tests, torch lights with intact batteries and uh, viable lenses and so on. And I think I was much wanted. In fact, when the chief minister of Tamil Nadu was admitted in some place, they will announce in the mic, Dr. K is Engirandalam Varavum, because not that I can examine the chief minister, I was only a junior person, but I used to carry the bag useful for my seniors. The professors used to come well dressed with pipe smoke and beautiful noises in the tapping foot, but they won't carry any equipments to examine in the patient, because they trust the juniors. As one of the trusted juniors, not only to help them in clinical examination, but also to carry the luggage for them. I think all of us should carry some of the small luggage with us instead of depending on it. And we may miss some of the important clinical signs unless we have a torch light, unless we have something to test like vibration sense and so on. Sir, thank you. Talking about the torch light, sir, I fondly remember the torch light you have given me and I also realized that you have given such torchlights to several people in addition to being the torchlight for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. And there you go. One of the greatest abilities a teacher must have is to become a student again. As you get old, 
to learn what is new is a tough task. Tougher still is the ability to unlearn what you learned earlier, but is now outdated. That's an impossible feat. But these are two extraordinary strengths which our great master possesses. I will recollect something on my own. Two decades ago, I had just joined as a consultant at Apollo Hospitals, Madurai. I met him on their corridor once. He used to come for rounds to our hospital those days. He mentioned about a seminar he was attending that evening and asked me whether I would be joining him. I said, sir, I did not receive any invitation for this. And he laughed and he gave me one of the most profound pieces of advice I ever got. He said, son, a scientific meeting requires information, not invitation. So that's the quality of a teacher. And here is his stunning quality ca teaching career, 1961 to 65, Aston Professor of Medicine at Stanley Medical College, Madras, 65 to 69, Aston Professor of Neurology at Stanley Medical College, Madras, and then more than two decades being the Professor of Neurology at Madurai Medical College, Madurai, 1970 to 1991. And importantly, during this time, he initiated the program of DM Neurology course recognized by the Medical Council of India as early as in 1970. So, sir, before I ask you about your teaching career, I'm just going to show the viewers a bit of a few of his photos as well. Let's make it lively by having some photos. So here is our sir, all young, and this I believe is in England. Sir, we'll talk about, sir, I'll ask you a few things about this in the later part of my talk. But here is a young student, Professor Dr. K.S. And then here, as he joined in his service, in his, during his illustrious career, with, you know, several people who are joined by themselves in their own respective fields. And here is something to talk about his career, sir. So can we just have some views about your career, sir? Can we just listen to you about your career? I think uh, I have worked in villages, town general hospital, district hospitals, and also in official hospitals before coming to medical colleges, including Tanjore, including Coimbatore, including Stanley and then lastly, General Hospital. So I think it's a very wide experience moving with uh, relatively poor people who teach us medicine, more than the rich people who shop with doctors. That was a great advantage to being, travel, being a doctor in the Murphysil for several years before taking up medicine. And all that I loved was the teacher's way of teaching me. I, I can tell you one instance, where my professor, we were discussing a case of PUO without any diagnosis, with all sorts of remitted investigations in those days. And he just tapped in the fever with rigor, sweating and loss of weight. He tapped him on the left shoulder and uh, he said, sir, he's, thanks sir, you have come back. These young doctors are torturing me. You will save me now, I am now saved. And then before he went, don't worry, these doctors are brilliant people. He tapped on his right shoulder and the patient shouted with pain. Sorry, sir, I'm deeply hurt. Then he called us PGs, so-called bright PGs in those days to his room and said, stupid fellows, what's the diagnosis? If you tap on the right shoulder and he has pain with fever and rigor, spikes and chills, what's the diagnosis? I thought it may be liver abscess. How did we miss the liver abscess? because it was not a downward enlargement of liver, it was an upward enlargement due to the upper lobe abscess. He was right, we put a needle, we drew anchovy sauce to press. So this is how knowledge improves by listening to your teacher. There are hundreds of examples, which made me realize more than books and textbooks or internet, there should be a good teacher and a useful place. Thank you, sir. I, I missed in sharing those slides. So let me just share those slides. I think it didn't run at that time. 
So just for the viewers, I would like to share these slides for sir. Here we go. So this is young Professor Dr. K S as a student, as he entered Queen Square, I believe, which we'll listen from sir in a short time. And this is when he joined his career. And these are, you know, photos belonging to his days in his professorship at Madurai with the doyens of various fields. So thank you, sir. I'll stop sharing from here on. Yeah. Okay. So let's hear something about your experiences while you were the professor of neurology at the famous Madurai Medical College. Well, Madurai Medical College uh, is probably the only one of the very few institutions anywhere with all specialties in one compound, pediatrics, cardiology, accidental services, infectious diseases, obstetrics, all sorts of things, so that the boy can, student can learn guided by a good teacher, anything at arm's length, he can run to the pediatric ward, he can run to the obstetric ward to attend to the patient instead of being trans patient being transported and being lost on the way as happens in general hospital Madras. So I think there is a great advantage compared to GH that we have all specialities of medicine in one compound and we had excellent teachers to guide us, to be with us till we leave the hospital. I think that's a great advantage I had. We must have planned like this for a future institution of medical sciences. Sir, it is not just an advantage you had, sir. I must say, Government Rajaji Hospital had the advantage of having Professor Dr. K. S. at the hem of the affairs, I must say. Sir, how did it happen that you started the MCA recognized course of DM Neurology as well as in 1970? How did that happen, sir? Um, actually, neurology was not a desirable field. Many, In fact, one of the senior, most, most respected professors of medicine Stanley and GH told me when I said I'm taking neurology, are you crazy? Are you mad? You want to see people improving or you want to see people being crushing to death? Why do you take that subject? Why don't you take something like cardiology or some endocrinology? So he said, you're a bright student. You want to waste your time? So he was literally sorry I took to neurology. So I said, that's the only field where there is a logic in medicine where we argue and some get the answer. Many times we only speculate as physicians. We don't prove the diagnosis. The surgeons prove the diagnosis or finish the patient, one of them, but they give the diagnosis anyway. But physicians, we discuss and we are in trouble. So I think neurology is a branch in which there is enough scope for a student to think and think of the basic sciences. So I thought I will take it. And that's on they encouraged me. I think uh, it, it's all decided by your teachers and not by the students when you move it who are worried about their future and feeding their bank balances. But the teachers want to guide you depending on the merits. And I think that's the way we should grow. Sir, I think Medical Council of India gave DRM Neurology course to Madurai because of you, I, we all believe, sir. And that should be the truth. Isn't that correct, sir? Yeah. In fact, um, I was, nobody was willing to come to Madurai as a neurologist. And uh, so my choice was not by selection, but by some other method. And so the medical council insisted, if you want to start MCH neurology, neurosurgery, you should have one neurologist in your panel. So that is why Dr. Ramuthi suggested, I was in Coimbatore and he said, you like to go to Madurai? Nobody wants to go to Madurai. I said, I raised my, both my arms and I said, I would like to go to Madurai and join. So that's how I joined neurology. And, and the first inspection council from medical council sanctioned me three seats. One professor can train only one student in those days, but I was given permission to stand 
three students because of the enormous technical skill we had. The investigations were all done by us, but reported from Bombay or Delhi or Bangalore or sometimes from abroad. So our results are very reliable. It is not based our reports on local. Most of them are untrained specialists in the pathology and bacteriology departments. So we had to look for health services elsewhere at that time. It was entirely different now. Uh, so, but however, the university said one professor cannot train more than two students by law, by our water, not by mother-in-law, but father-in-law, but it's by some law. And then he said, okay, sir, that they restricted my, so I think I was the first professor to train two students. I was the only professor, but I was very lucky that I have to study more and more to train them better. So and, then we had, and then we had visit by Professor Rolf Johnson, director of the British Postgraduate Medical Federation, FRS, PRCP, all FRCP of all the colleges, highest qualified man, New Zealander, who visited Madurai, my work department, uh, very highly impressed with the bedside investigations we do for autonomic nervous system, neuros, dynamometry, sweating levels in the body, postural hypotension, simple, without any computer. He, was, he has written a book on autonomic nervous system. The next book was written by Roger Bannister. The first book was by Rolf Johnson and Spalding. He was terribly impressed with the mother I set up, working above the court and under the court because of crowded inpatient strength. He then recommended training in mother I for graduates from United States, from UK, from Canada, from Australia and New Zealand for the next two years. So uh, we have to train candidates, not only from Tamil Nadu, but also from abroad for nearly two years. That's a great complement to clinical neurology available at Madurai. And, uh, and you, you took the Madurai neurology to dizzy heights, I must say, because even before CT scan came to Chennai, you were instrumental in getting CT scan placed in Madurai first. Is that correct, sir? And how did that happen? Yeah, it's very interesting. The first CT scan was only for head CT scan, not total body. It was installed in All India Institute and also in, in uh, Chennai General Hospital. You know, the highest preference in our country is given to the Defense Institute. Of course, the Defense Institute India has the first and the best equipment according to president, it comes under president of India, not under prime minister of India. And it was always privileged. And, and second CT scan was total body CT scan. And that time MGR was chief minister. And naturally, Stanley Hospital wanted to have the second CT scan. And uh, we were all terribly upset that uh, it's so much of crowd in our outpatient, we should have it in Madurai, to improve doctors, at least, if not the patients, to learn more <laughs> from the CT scan. Because unless you do take two or three CT scans, you don't know whether you're right or wrong in your diagnosis. And uh, a hematoma will appear tomorrow and not today, it will be a negative CT scan. And, and this is privilege with free CT scan. No charge was made to any patient in those days. It was a benefit to doctors because we learned about our mistakes by repeating the scans. So we insisted. But I adopted a dirty politics, which you must remember, uh, I have to share it, it doesn't matter, because I said in Chennai, the population at those times, it was uh, nearly unity in diversity. We had more North Indians and South Indians, more Gujaratis, more Telugu others. Tamilians are only one third of Chennai those days. So I, I got some politicians to work on this idea. And they helped me to shape the idea. Tell the chief minister MGR that if you want to help Tamil Nadu with another CT scan, it must be Madurai, not Stanley, because it will be serving 90% of Tamilians and 10% of non-Tamilians. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a stupid way of uh, getting something done, but it is scientifically, sometimes we are asked to say white lies, so we can do some, some wrong things in life for a better future. That's how we got this scan, and when MGR came back from United States after, I mean, all this 
renal transplant surgery, and so on and so forth, diabetic control. He came to Madurai straight with his family doctor, permanent doctor, Dr. Balasamani Subramanian, B.R. Subramanian, who was my close associate in Stanley in rectal clinic, working in the afternoon. I used to get him a coffee and he will give me opportunity to operate on the rectum and anal canal. That's how I became closer. That's how all of us should become closer to surgeons and see what's happening by being useful to them first and then being helpful to them later on and learning ourselves later on. And he said, he brought MGR to Madurai at midnight to my clinic. Midnight to my clinic. He opened his Rajaji hospital at midnight because in the daytime you can't uh, you can't accommodate the chief minister in the crowd, enormous crowd, and it will paralyze the rest of the traffic. So we did the MRI, I mean CT scan on him. I did an EMG on him for his peripheral neuropathy with a Hyderabad old machine. And he was thoroughly impressed because Paul Sumanam said, we have now the confirmed, confirmed diagnosis, not the provisional diagnosis than I brought. I think that's how it's uh, introduced somebody by somebody greater than me. Thank you. <laughs> so nice to hear that, sir. In fact, as you are telling, you're talking about that vada and coffee. So <laughs> we fondly remember those days when we used to attend your class, both for two things, one for your lecture and second for the vada and coffee you would serve us. It was very that's cheap in those days. Initiative. <laughs> very cheap in those days. 15 years <laughs> but it mattered a lot to all of us. You would be engaged in both ways, culinary as well as intelligence. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I must uh, tell you a small digression. One of my classes used to extend between two and three, and many people will be anxious to listen for sake of exams. And one of my assistants, very jovial man, was telling that final Wimbledon is being played upstate. Don't worry about Dr. K.S. He won't be here. He'll be here tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Let us go and look at the Wimbledon. Let's <laughs> move on. The boy said, no, sir, we have an exam. First question is no choice, sir. Don't worry, take the next question. And then these doctors told the PGs, there is another exam next year. You won't see this Wimbledon next year. <laughs> you will miss these tall words. Think about this. <laughs> so in spite of this backward, Back door resistance, I have to take the classes, but it was good. Boys prefer to listen to my class than to see the Wimbledon. Sir, one of the reasons was that you, you never saw the watch. You always stayed in the hospital. You stayed to teach people like us. So that's one great quality which you had, which inspired all of us. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, we would also like to hear your Queen's Choir days. We know that you went there to actually get some training. But what we heard later was that you ended up teaching and training several students, peers, and colleagues. So tell us something about your London days as well, sir. We are I all think, here to hear that. I think every neurologist, every neurologist should visit Queen Square, uh, uh, but a, at a scholarship or at his own expense, at least for six months, because it's the only institution where you have 25 neurologists and 25 neuroscients of highest caliber working together to teach us. Even in the United States, even in Europe, even in self you don't get as many neurologists and neurosurgeons in, in a single compound. So that, I know, and all of them are a very high caliber. You can't get a placement in Queen's Square unless you are really of a very high standard, even in British standards. And I, so I learned quite a lot in one year what I'd have learned in five years in our country because of mornings I do neurology and afternoons I will be in cardiology, pulmonology, renal medicine. Wherever there is a free lecture, free demonstration, I'll be there by the tube train to attend that because our bank balance was minimal and I had to plan my financial status also. And it was enormously grateful to me to learn about medicine in its reality Neurology in its reality based on sound general medicine to be a good doctor for the future, safe to you and to the patient. And, that, that's what, and the second thing is neurological teaching in Queen Square is methodical, structured, and step by step. So you have to wait for 15 minutes 
in every lecture before the first point is told to you. You have to be very patient. You should not jump, jump to the conclusion. They are, we know better than them. In our country, we have better teachers. No, no wrong. They teach you the best things in the later part of the lecture only. The best points come in the last few slides. So we must be patient to learn from them. And I was lucky to learn this from top people like Denny Brown from United States who visited US. I presented cases to him and I learned a lot of neurology from him. He asked me how I have missed some signs. The case of Wilson's disease was presented and he said Wilson's disease. I said, it's not Wilson's disease because you have no KF ring. Then he said, it's not Wilson's. So Dr. K has find it out what it is, but it's clinically Wilson's. It may be not biochemically Wilson's. And then I found it later on. And then I said, he has no axial incoordination. He has no axial dystonia. How can you diagnose Wilson's with an axial dystonia? He said, ask me to bring a stool, ask the patient to come around the stool clockwise and anti-clockwise three times. And the patient had gross axial dystonia. The only test which I have not done, I have done the compass test, I have done all the routine tests. Because a man like Denny Brown visiting, I would have prepared for three days at least to present the case to him. But I missed this test. So I think I learned quite a lot of these things in Queen Square. Another case, headache, vomiting, papilledema, no localizing signs. Dr. McCardle, who teaches us once in two weeks at the age of 80, climbed the steps, not using the lift. Brilliant clinical neurologist. He asked the lady to bend forward, strain to a well salva. Asked me to palpate the front of the eyeballs. One of the eyeballs propped up. And then he said, Dr. K, what's the diagnosis? Said, I know it's a sphenoidal rid meningioma because she had papilledema, but no localizing signs. And then he said, these are not a medicine students. Can you teach them something? I said, sir, I know about aortic aneurysms, the aneurysm of science to the right of sternum with pain, angina, severe tenderness, death, even sudden death. The aneurysm of symptoms, which is in the ortho diota, producing laryngeal palsy, sometimes cardiac problems and so on. And then the medical legal aneurysms, which is in the abdominal aorta, discussed post-mortem, but missed clinically by us because it dies in an accident. So, he appreciated my general medicine knowledge. And I said, today I've taught you neurology. You can taught me, teach me general medicine. It's very, very interesting. It's the way they encouraged you. And there are many such examples of clinical neurology being taught to us by pundits or experts in US. And I have also pleasure to listen to Sir Charles Simmons, who used to answer queries from Edinburgh, teaching in London. Another lady with migraine for several teach several countries and negative pneumoencephalogram in those days. There's only investigation, no CT scan in those days. I'm talking of 1968. And then he told Henry Miller in Edinburgh, ask her to bend forward, stress, strain, try a well valve, and then look at the pupil. She did that and he found one pupil was dilating. Then he said, and Charlie Simmons from London, taking clinics to us, phoned up Henry Miller. She should have an anterior third ventricle tumor. They repeated the new minds of program and there was an anterior third ventricle tumor. I mean, these are the type of clinical medicine not learned from books, but by hard work and, and the legacies of neurologists. There are many such examples they can go on, but I think learning is very easier, much easier when you're surrounded by too many good neurologists. And that was that is Queen Square. So I think somebody, some of some all neurologists should have some such center. We have very good people in our country, you know. I'm talking of 40 years ago. Now we've got brilliant people in our country, but they're all in one one place. We have to travel to several places, wait for several days to listen to them, to learn from them. This is just instead of traveling abroad for holidays, we can spend three or four weeks in an institution. Thank you. And, and you became popular by your case sheets. You impressed the people there. And you also became popular because you started teaching them. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, the case sheets writing is, is an exercise which is best exercise for a, any physician to do. To write a good case sheet, a, a honest case sheet without mixing up findings and so on. 
And I think uh, the, I'll tell you an example. There is a case of Parkinsonism, which was uh, diagnosed by a senior neurosurgeon and posted for surgery for stereotaxy. And uh, I was asked to write the case sheet. I didn't know about the diagnosis and the treatment decided already. I was just asked to write the case sheet. I was paid 100 rupees per case sheet in those days. And uh, I found it as a classical case of hyperthyroids. He had lid lag, tachycardia, muscle wasting, fasciculations, brisk reflexes, all that you want for a thyroid, hyperthyroids. And of course, he had a tremor, which was not a resting tremor, which was tremor throughout. But somehow he has been posted for a stereotactic telemotomy because he was one of the richest man from Andhra Pradesh. And uh, so my case, it was, I, the last line, the diagnosis was struck off and he went through surgery. After that, I was asked to follow up the case. I sent the case to Coimbatore, to Leela Minachi. PSG hospital was the best in cancer diagnosis and treatment in those days in Tamil Nadu. And she diagnosed hyperthyroidism, gave him radioactive iodine, he became improved. Then I presented this case in clinical meeting. He had two problems. One was hyperthyroidism, the other was pseudo-Parkinsonism. And both of them are better. And he was much better on the operated side. But his, a left telemotomy, right telemotomy was done for the left hand tremor. And after thyroid treatment, the tremor was much better again on the left side than on the right side. George Selby, who was in the Institute of Neurology, had many visitors in those days. One of them, was, apart from Dennis Williams, Tiki Walsh, and others, George Selby was with us for a week. And he taught us extra pyramidal system by calling, say, EMS as a telemus, UMS as a SMS as coded nucleus. All of us changed our figures. And he taught us basal ganglia anatomy brilliantly. And he published a paper that in Parkinson's, if you give L-dopa, he is not better. And you now operate to a telemotomy. Again, you'll have better results on the telemotomy side, on the corresponding side. And it was published in many papers. So I said, Parkinson's with the telemotomy, results will be better in the telemotomy side. I mean, <laughs> where you can, because it's all done free of charge. Don't worry. <laughs> all just taking, without paying any money, not in a private hospital. Taking no. advantage of an adversity. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I'm going to share a photo here. So just allow me to share this photograph. So here we go. Yeah, so that's your certificate from none other than Professor Dr. Dennis Williams. Anything on this, sir? Very good. I think he was an editor of Brain. And uh, actually, when I joined the United Kingdom as a postgraduate fellow, I was offered felicitations and all praise, saying thank you that you're a highly valued doctor from India. You know, I'd be hurt to know that you are a very good physician, all sorts of praise, but nothing, no knowledge to be imported. So I went to the dean and I said, I want to work as a clinical clerk to write case sheets and do investigations. And said, he said, are you crazy? You want to work under young, stupid MRCPs here who have passed because of knowledge, not because of experience. You are more experienced than anybody can have the knowledge. I, I said, I, I beg your feet. Please permit me to write case sheets and to do the investigations and to learn from them. So he said, you are risking your good time in UK. Instead of enjoying UK, you are going to suffer. He said, okay, I leave it to you. That's the Dean's order to me. I was to work under four consultants, psychiatrist, Dennis Hill, the top Institute of Neurology London is one of the best. He had four beds. Neurosurgeon, Willie Mekisak, topmost neurosurgeon in the world, he had four beds. And then neurologist, Dennis Williams, he had eight beds. And then another four beds for a neuro-ophthalmologist and neuro and so on. So I had the benefit of learning 
as a house surgeon, after bossing MD at all, his medicine in Chennai, to, to learn from them how to process these cases from top pundits in the world. So I think that's the way we should start learning before we start practicing entirely on our own. That, that's really awesome, sir. I will take you to one another very important photo. You must see that, yeah, this is your hospital. So institute, which you consider as best. Thank you very much, sir. I, that's Wilder Penfield. Um, I attended his lecture on where they afforded me FRS. FRS is the highest degree they give. He is from Canada, but all the British neurologists and neurosurgeons said he should be given FRS. And he made a most insulting remark saying, most neurologists sitting on the front row, Sir Charles Simmons, Dennis Williams, McDonald, Critchley, all brilliant people. He said, you speculate. We neurosurgeons prove the point and teach medicine and neurology. You discuss and dissipate. That's how he started his lecture. In spite of it, he got a us because <laughs> he started being insulted because he presented the best case I have ever seen of a draftsman who is unable to complete the draft, the engineer who is able to drawing because of problems in his temporal lobe, being disturbed by a telephone call by a pretty nurse or some disturbance in the hall, phone calls from home, etc. So every time he is disturbed, he cannot redraw the whole structure. So the waste paper basket was getting full but he hadn't drawn a single draft for the picture. They found that he had already a temporal lobectomy done by Murray Falconer, who was a, for a, a temporal lobe there. So he had only one temporal lobe. And Pen Penfield concluded on clinical examination that this man must have a disease of the opposite temporal lobe because memory is a bilateral function and is never lost by a unilateral temporal lobectomy, both including verbal and nonverbal memory who are shared by both. And he was right. He waited for him to die for 10 years. And postmortem showed, postmortem showed Penfield was right. His right temporal lobe, the only avail, the remaining temporal lobe was also totally scarred. And that's why he had this problem. He cannot complete a drawing. So that was a presentation for which you given a for us. You will agree. I don't think anybody deserves more than Penfield for his efforts. <laughs> and one more photo, sir. This is Dr. Fred Palm. And any, anything about him, sir? Oh, gosh, I have plenty of things to say about him. He was my PhD examiner. My PhD was certified as good by Fred Plum, second top consultant next to Raymond Adams and Gashwin in the United States at that time. And the Dean of Institute of Neurology. Uh, I, okay. And then he invited me to give a lecture in New York and gave me a university dinner and so on. That's anyway, but he was a very tough man in the United Kingdom and the United States. He came to Hyderabad. This is a Hyderabad conference, so the Indian Academy, the Neurological Society of India before IAN became full blown in those days. And then uh, he, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu visited him uh, in the United States for a second opinion of the stroke which from which he has recovered. But, he didn't go with appointment, so he asked him to come back later on. And then somehow they knew that his chief minister's doctor, BRS, knew that I know Fred Plum. So I had to talk to Fred Plum, and our chief minister had a next trip to the United States, and he was seen by him. And he said, the best treatment has been done. We have nothing better to tell you. So he returned. But he invited the Dr. Fred Plum to Chennai for a, as a state guest. So the always arrange. but something wrong happened in our communication system, which happens in the government always or very often. He arrived at Zenvi at Delhi airport and our staff is waiting at Madras airport. So it was a chaos and he got furious. So he arrived at Hyderabad conference and he was furious with me. He didn't even talk to me for a few minutes, although he was my good friend. And then Arjun Das said, if you trust politicians, you can't do anything better. And you enter <laughs> You have trusted the neurologist. And very casually, he said, and he tapped me on the back and don't get worried. Anyway, that's Fred Plum, and a very good man. His book on stupor and coma must be read to be appreciated. His 
is the best medicine in gen best book on general medicine not really neurology thank you and this is the doctor barnet sid sid barnet he i was his colleague in the icmr committee because of, i had some done work on venous strokes so fibrinogen etc being more important than platelets in in ischemic strokes that's my view even now and then he was um, the authority on carotid endotomy indicates for surgery all of you know that he should have a 80% 70% stenosis after having recovered from a stroke on that day carotid artery he must have expertise and so on anyway he was very kind he invited me to canada and i gave some lectures in canada brilliant people only one thing i want to tell you if you want to write a paper on any subject like hypertension or diabetes or stroke if you write a paper on 10 cases it should be thrown into the bucket he insists you should have done work on 500 strokes and 500 controls to write a paper on common subjects in hypertension diabetes i think that's true it will hold you high head high in the long run instead of having applause for short presentation of good cases next one thank you and a, a few words about uh, sir macdonald crichley with whom oh, we were close he's super he is a neurologist i worked with for a short time in queen square who made rounds without knee hammer without stethoscope without anything in his hand except a pretty secretary to write his notes <laughs> by the side that's all so what inspired you sir crichley or his secretary <laughs> he she inspired both the audience and the speaker <laughs> and uh, and uh, he was a he is a man who has written a book on parietal lobe you know benton has written a book on frontal lobe dennis williams on temporal lobes they are all masters they live in the in the temporal lobes and parietal lobes to write books on them you know we live outside the parietal lobes and you have known about erigma of justman syndrome etc etc but wonderful thing is he can make a diagnosis the way you walk in the way you bump on objects the way you miss the objects the way you miss your tea cup from that the neurological diagnosis is made without using much of the equipment that's based on his enormous experience i don't want to say more about this because it's book on parietal lobe is wonderful so here we go to some other you know area and uh, you know this is a person who is very close to your heart so let us hear something about uh, you know it, it is said that you know great people it's it's all in your genes professor dr k is one of the most eminent neurologists this country has ever seen passed on all his genes to his son dr ravi shrinivasan consultant neurologist and in intensive care at st george epsom and st helier hospital london so should be, this should be a very interesting story let's hear from you sir how did you inspire your son into medicine and then neurology and is the hem of affairs just a few words about him First of all, there is a mistake. Is SMS the genes come from the wife, not from the father? Then the X for intelligence is from the wife, not from the father. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Now he is he came on his own, and Doctor EMS uh, is one of his very close guides. Uh, with EMS brilliance, I am sure he would not have done much worse. He should have done better. And uh, Uh, he had a good training at ramachandra and he was very good encouragement at queen square and when he passed his diploma examination and then his mrcb etc and he is on his own as a consultant in neuro intensive care in st george's hospital works along with anthony bail who visited jail elsa for a short period and sometimes the midnight i get phone calls from both from anthony bail and my son about how to manage a case uh, Uh, in their circumstances uh, that doesn't matter because they got all the equipments but sometimes the diagnosis is in trouble and with some experience we are common sense we do a little better sometimes i think he's doing very well intensive care is something you need a lot of general medicine medical specialty and he is trained and at least four consultants see the same patient every day so he is in the best of circumstances the patient is fully protected even if you are ignorant the other consultant will correct you that's how most of the london hospitals work and i'm 
priority is there. It should be better. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, even though you say that it's coming from uh, the, 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 the mother, so I don't think there is one iota of truth, sir. And the second point is that I don't I agree with you with everything, but not this point, because we know Dr. Ravi as well. And he once told me that it is easier to be your son, but very difficult to be a legend son and a neurologist. So that, that's what he once declared with me. We had very happy moments, sir. Thank you very much for talking about it. And you have often been saying this, and it's a very important point which you taught many of us, you always used to believe that when we used to say we are super specialists, you told us that neurology is a subspeciality of medicine. And in fact, all the so-called super specialities are subspecialities. So what made you say this and what are your views on this? Sir? <coughs> I know there are some diseases, for example, in my PhD thesis in coma, uh, one major finding was that if you see 100 patients admitted for coma in a large teaching hospital, um, many of them die. We had postmortem more than scans in those days, confirmed the diagnosis much better. We found 60% will be metabolic causes and only 40% is structural causes. One or two may be psychiatric. And which means metabolic causes of coma means it's coming from outside the brain. It's not neurology, it's not just general medicine. It's diabetes, it's uremia, it's renal failure, or uh, poisoning, hypoglycemia, what, so whatever it is. If the problem is outside the brain. You know, uh, no amount of MRI scans and PET scans will bring out any diagnosis. It's a waste of time. So, but that's not true in India. In India, 60% is structural due to stroke, meningitis, brain tumors, head injury, and so on. But in the West, Western countries, it is 60% metabolic because of overlap of cases due to alcohol overdose and drug overdose and various other problems. So, but, so I think therefore neurologist is, is only 60% neurology. 40% has to be general medicine at least. And the best, if it is 60% medicine and 40% neurology, you'll be a better neurologist. <laughs> 100% general medicine and a little bit of neurology will be the best neurologist. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a simple point. Another thing you find is, as you have seen, there are some conditions like mitochondrial disease. There are some conditions like uh, celiac disease. There are some uh, conditions which affect all endothelial diseases. Endothelium is the largest endocrine organ in the body. It supplies everything from brain to foot. And if there's an endothelial disorder, you will find you, neurological signs anywhere in the body. And it is out, it's, it's detected by high, not high ESR, but high CRP. And if you find somebody with a high CRP and problems suspecting multi organs, multi system failure, you must think of an endothelial disease affecting neurology. It may, you can cloud it, say, to immunology and genetics and so many other blah, 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 but may not reach the final conclusion. But still, these things will lead you to the correct diagnosis. So mitochondrial diseases are also multi-system oriented because the mitochondrium is necessary for the brain, the liver, the lungs, muscles everywhere. And those diseases are also multiple. So I think a neurologist should be good in mitochondrial diseases and endothelial diseases, but which should be a general physician, not neurologist by itself. But we are all general physicians only basically, then we became neurologists. And we become better general physicians by being good neurologists. Thank you for that great wisdom, sir. I, I'll share a, uh, another you know, interesting photo. And this is your family. I'll just yeah. run with your family photos for a bit. So this is your other son. And then this is your family photos. And then this is, uh, this is with your My brothers. Brother. I, I, at this point of time, I should thank your brothers also who took their time out to share these photos, which I received from them. 
and these are your sisters. So let us know here about your family, sir. How were you as a family man? And how was it for your family to see you as a legend? I mean, we all know you as a neurologist, as a teacher, but it should have been tough for your family to cope up with a legend like you. I think, Dr. SMS, this should be out of context. We are talking a family with two members nowadays, not 10 members. <laughs> <laughs> we are anti-national. We produce a family like this. <laughs> Sir, but they were good in their own so way. This qualification, but the qualification is that you learn to live with people with low income, share your little knowledge, help financial or otherwise with brothers and sisters, bring them up in life. So that's a great experience for a future to be live with a, even a highly expensive wife or two sons. I think we learn a lot and I don't think anything particular. All of us had large families and we had less income than what we have now. All of them are supportive with each other. In fact, my brother supported, paid my MBBS fees because he got an IAS class one job with a BSc qualification. I was to wait till I finish MD, DM and so on for a small job. <laughs> so I think sometimes better to have brothers of other fields. Thank you. <laughs> but they see you very fondly, sir. And I, I, I once again would like to thank the family members for sharing their photos for this show. Thank you. Thank you, really. Thank, thanks, Dr. Ravi, for sharing those photos as well. So now we are live in the talk show of Indian Academy of Neurology. And, sir, you are one of the founder members. In fact, you are also one of the past presidents of NSI. So let's hear some experiences with these academic bodies, sir. Let's hear something from there. I don't get you, Vinasar. What's it? You are one of the founding members of yes, Indian yes. Academy of Neurology. Yeah, I know. Past okay, president okay. of NSI. Welcome to the point. This is like medicine, general medicine and neurology. I am one of those people <laughs> who was working with Dr. Chopra, Dr. Gauri Devi, and uh, Sina and all. We were all, some of us were not happy about the formation of IAM because we thought you were going away from the living brain, which is the surgeon's problem. Many neurologists have not seen a pulsating brain. That's wrong in our days. Now with uh, deep brain stimulation and various invasive techniques, some invasion is made into the brain, but we are invading like Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, not like Indians. <laughs> Neurosurgeons are Indians. <laughs> I'm just telling you jokingly because I think Unless we work with the neurosurgeons day and night, they will commit more mistakes and we will also commit more, more and more mistakes. Because nobody is there telling them they are wrong. Nobody is telling them you are also wrong. So I think so. It's not a good decision to die, completely diverge neurology neurosurgery, although we must have separate meetings, regional meetings and so on. Anyway, that's my point. I was overlooked totally by Chopra, who was always a fighting spirit. And, and the society was formed, that's why. And I even now believe you must be in a combined session with the physicians, neurologists, neurosurgeons. Even API, I feel, should not have split too much. We have split too much. And it's like sharing a property which is not large with too many children. Property should be large to share. <laughs> So there are splitters and lumpers, they say. Yeah. So there's something like that you're sharing. So let I me just share a few photos belonging to this IAN uh, issue. So allow me to share those photos here. So this is your Indian Academy of Neurology photos, which we collected. So here is one, and this is a 2000 IAN conference. This is at Madurai, and we had a great visitor, which I think I'm sure you're going to share. So let us hear something about your IA in days, sir. Yeah, the, I used to attend all the conferences uh, when I was more healthy like you, <laughs> and I get younger in age. <laughs> I never missed. I, may, I attended many world congresses at my own expense, not by 
company sponsorship in those days and i will i am the one who sits from the first day to the last day till the validatory function in most functions because I, i don't want to miss anything having paid for it real <laughs> space for it and you're an outstanding delegate all the time <laughs> anyway um i think i learned quite a lot nayan about other people appreciating our work and a lot of uh, cross talking with each other i'll tell you one story dr the delhi neurosurgeon top neurosurgeon who is a head of the neurosciences of india whatever it is um, now he was presenting a case of 5000 500 gliomas on the right brain and 500 gliomas on the left brain in a national conference and um, my talk was next to him and that was on right and left brain functions mostly right brain functions anyway that's a reason matter the, the the grammar and glamour of brain that was my talk now dr chopra asked him Um, what is his name the senior most neurologist in delhi anyway um, neurosurgeon anyway, he he said many cases the language improved aphasia improved after removal of the tumor so this created a very violent discussion how can a neurosurgeon cure aphasia it has come later so chopra in his usual way Dr. Tandon, his name is Tandon. Dr. Tandon, do you know how to test for aphasia? <laughs> the national conference. Did you consult a neurologist whether it's a language disorder at all? Then Dr. Ramudi said, "No, this is not the way to insult a neurosurgeon." Dr. K, what do you say? No, sir. I think he wants more details. I have to solve the problem. I am usually a mediator. Sir, he wants to know whether the tumor was. disconnecting the speech the broca's area from the other areas so he connected it after removing the tumor or it was a broca's area tumor that he removed and the patient get got better in which case the diagnosis could be wrong so i solved the problem and helped tandon to answer that many times it was the connections that produce aphasia not the speech center and that is relieve the pressure the speech may recover otherwise i think speech cannot recover in an adult with a neuro by a neuro surgeon so i agree so, and then dr kamurthy complimented me for that he said my lecture was the best he has heard in 20 years on human brain on the brain failure and so on and he complimented both of us for the largest experience of gliomas to tandem and the best talk that's how as more senior man behaves <laughs> and and those days you know those, those those were the days we first saw none other than uh, dr abdul kalam sir with you in iam yes we invited him abdul kalam uh, was at madurai as a president of india and when he said i have traveled east and west north and south bengal bombay uh, rajasthan everywhere they say their guru in neurology is madurai dr k s i want to see him so that's what compliment he paid is it i was on one of the national gurus and he paid a compliment here and gauri devi was on the chair that's because of the students <laughs> sir being a member of the scientific committee of world congress of neurology is by itself an achievement being its chairman is remarkable So tell us about your experience as the chairman at Vancouver in 1994, and you were also the chairman of the stroke session of the World Congress of Neuropathology at Perth, Australia, in 1993. So what were your experiences as the chairman of these two important conferences? The World Congress of Neurology at Vancouver, Canada. I was the scientific committee chairman. Uh, by a little bit of accident happened. I was the vice chairman, and the chairman became ill. so i was promoted as a chairman and i was chosen as a chairman by norman gershwin and uh, fred plummer others 
for that conference. That's with some familiarity with them, I got into it rather easily. I mean, it was a tough job. And uh, I was in Madurai very uh, before that all. I got a big box of 5,000 papers to be presented at the World Congress of Neurology in Madurai in my home. Those days, computerized transport was less popular and less available and less viable. I have to look at all the 5,000 papers and classify them. I can take some lessons if you want. And then there is a very fond letter addressed by the president of the World Federation of Neurology to me. Dear Dr. K.S., we know about your skills and intelligence, etc. That's not the problem. The problem is this is the World Congress. It means it represents the world. Use your discretion to see that the world is represented, not just the best in the world brain cortex. That gave me a clue that I can't reject a paper from South Africa or some Timbuktu because it's of no quality, but I must accommodate it in some way to see that the World Congress is represented by the world. So I had to do all that work. So I, it's a pleasure, but without computer or assistance help, I didn't manage because I had lots of time to do that. And, and the Congress, it, uh, Congress at Perth Royal, that was a very bad trip for me because I was asked to travel at my own expense, and, but with the promised local hospitality, which did not arrive till next day. And then I was at the airport with a lot of arthritis, pain, etc. Et and uh, two other people only came from India. That was one from Professor of Neuropathology from Chandigarh, Banerjee, and Dr. Sarala Das from Bangalore. And I refused to stay with them because I said I am an official uh, in the organizing committee. I can't don't have my dignity with staying in a hotel. So I was left in the airport for three hours without anybody to pick me up. So anyway, I had a lot of problems attending the conference. But in the main thing was in the conference, the, the question I asked, I was in charge of the stroke session. I was asked to choose the best speakers in stroke in, among the, around the world. They gave me a list. That was, a, that was a great opportunity for me to choose the speakers on stroke. And I, Actually, ministry, I told him, you talk about dead tissues, you talk about living tissues, why are you inviting me? And he said, no, you want you to create the link. <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what Brian Kakulas, who was the chairman of this session and who was the head of the neuropathologist and the dean of Royal Perth Hospital, uh, invited me. And uh, next day, he suffocated me, embracing me too tightly, said, Dr. K, you are from God, you are a donation from God. He was so kind to me. He didn't allow me to say, word, say I had a very bad night previous day staying in a YMCA and nothing has been arranged for me. And I did some <laughs> casualty emergency work in the Perth hospital, stitching up some wounds because there were not enough doctors in the night. Drunken women chasing us away. All this I experienced but in, on this invitation. But next day he didn't allow me to. He said, oh, why are you praising me so much before I could say a word? because others have very bad words against me. <laughs> <laughs> Many people had wrong. So I asked the manager from Chandigarh, what was your experience? Did you have a nice room accommodation? He said, nonsense. There was no place, nothing was booked for me. I was on the streets in the Perth the whole night. Then I said, come, let us write a book on Perth by night, don't worry. <laughs> That's all. Anyway, the one question I asked was, I have seen several patients in Madurai who have been diagnosed as glioblastoma grade, grade four, operated at Chennai or Bombay, predicted to die in the next few weeks because of extensive glioblastoma. And they come to me here because they have belonged to Madurai or Bayerbe districts, saying that I may do something to keep them alive. And it works that they live for two years, three years in my treatment. So what happened? How did I work? My treat I give the same medicine to everybody. And this gives the wrong message to people that I can see, save dying people. That's the wrong message. And uh, this question I asked in the Royal, the World Congress of Neuropathology at Perth. And it gave me the answer, which is commonplace now, which is, uh, revealing in those days, so many years ago I'm talking, was P53 gene 
if you do look at it, you can say whether the glioma is becoming malignant to become glioblastoma, or it is glioblastoma from the word go. With that gene, you can say this is genetically a glioblastoma. This is genetically a glioma. Thing. So I've seen in London also a patient with glioma treated for five years, operated, and the biopsy report came brain edema because they took a biopsy from the edematous portion of the tumor, and he lived for 10 years and so on and died. So these mistakes happen in those days, where CT scan MRI was quite uncommon in those days. I'm talking of those days. When CT scan and MRI were uncommon, our human brain was better used. That's the problem. And then, <clears throat> so I feel <coughs> there are tumors which the neurosurgeon thinks glioblastoma based on histology. Now, of course, you have genetic profiling and various methods of genetic diagnosis. That mistakes may not happen. <coughs> Thank you, sir. So let me just go over some of your great works. So let me just share, you know, a photograph here. So I'm just running through some <coughs> of the important publications, like this phenomenal work on cerebral venous thrombosis. Those days when CT, MRI, nothing was available, and people were having postmortem reports of, you know, using, you know, having hemorrhagic infarction. You are one of the pioneers who first proposed that <coughs> heparin could be used even in the presence of hemorrhage. So that was something phenomenal we all learned. So let me just take you through those, you know, one of the few important studies which I collected. One is about CVT and then about infantile uh, <coughs> hemiplegia, ischemic cerebrovascular disease in young, talking about two common cases, and then cerebral palsy, infantile hemiplegia, <coughs> And your work with neurosyphilis, and your work again with the you know right and left brain and so uh, amital so amital test, so many achievements, stupendous really. So let's hear something about your publications, your research. So briefly, cerebral venous thrombosis. Uh, we had 1970, 90 percent of the patients dying with that diagnosis throwing convulsions and dying on the way to be transported to the neuro department. And so we had some beds and what saved them was routine anti-conversion therapy and a routine ICU therapy mostly. And then the bleeding was due to clotting. Like DIC, DIC, you have two types of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. In one, we give heparin because the clotting, which is caused by intravascular coagulation. So you have to give heparin. So this is a different story. So likewise, I started giving heparin IV six severely for two days. And we did only serum fibrinogen at the bedside. And fibrinogen is always raised in these people. And once that is raised, heparin should be given. And within three or four days, the patients got better with control of convulsions. And they walked out of the hospital with good prognosis without any neurological deficit. Venous strokes are one in which the patient recovers completely without any residual deficit, venous strokes. Why? Because veins are larger supply than arteries. They have multiple channels. They are massive. Sagittal sinus thrombosis can occur without any infarction in the parasagittal area to produce cortical paraplegia because of collateral venous drainage. In spite of massive clot, they may still survive. Not in the deep cerebral vein thrombosis, but in cortical thrombosis. Anyway, that's how we learned. We learned, and later on it became very powerful. And Lancet, which published, which initially criticized me in my papers in the United States, were crazy to give heparin. Then wrote back saying, blood in the brain is an indication of heparin in venous strokes. That was Lancet's publication. Anyway, that's how it says spread. And about uh, the other good work we have done is co cognitive neurology. Now we have many infantile hemiplegias where we do carotid angiograms to know that the middle cerebral artery is blocked. And then the patient, even if he has a right hemiplegia and aphasia, he completely recovers, becomes left-handed because speech center shifts to the opposite side. This, I have done commit all this in hundreds of them. Many people have done all over the world and this is a well-known fact that hemisphere speech center can shift in children. But what I have done originally, which has been never done and then not done by anybody in the world is the fact I quote hold of about less than 10 patients who had lost the right arm due to amputation. 
due to poliomyelitis, due to various problems. And therefore, they have become left-handed. They have no brain lesion. Their intelligent memory language is normal, earlier development. There, I have done the amitol speech test, and the speech center does not travel, change to the opposite side. So that because by your left-handed in habits earlier in life, the speech center will not shift to the opposite side. This is very valuable because in US and Europe, still there are people treated for clumsy habits, clumsy limbs, dropping objects easily, stuttering of speech, with splinting one side of the body to make him one-sided or dominance, thinking that that will grow. They thought it's a old theory, stupid theory, that these two diseases are due to ambidextrous habits and unestablished cerebral hemisphere dominance. They are not able to use the right or left arm by decision, so they drop the objects. They are indecisive, they are clumsy and so on. This is a very wrong skew, and I think my research proved it. So that's why I was deputed by the ICMR and the scientific CSIR to the World Congress of Neurology at uh, Budapest in Hungary. Hungary, you know, the river Danube divides it into Buda on one side, Pest on the other side. And in that conference, I was asked to discuss with computer guides. Well, anyway, I didn't proceed further on this to on the Nobel Prize side because many Nobel laureates are asked to discuss with me in this subject. But I, I didn't want to become a Nobel laureate with growing beers and drinking wine and smoking cigarettes and targeting <laughs> the world. <laughs> and yet, the theory you prove may be proved wrong by somebody later. <laughs> I have seen several, two Nobel laureates in my lecture in Chennai. Uh, one was Linus Pauling, who attended my lecture on genetics. The other was the, the, the Watson and Wright, double helix man. Wright was in my lecture, sitting and asking me questions. But I was very impressive in my lecture to those genetic dyes because I don't know anything about molecular genetics. I am stupid, ignorant fellow, but I know about clinical genetics. We can produce plenty of cases with genetic problems, chromosomal disorders, mitochondrial disorders, and many other things. But they don't have, they only work with butterflies and insects. They are good in the laboratory, not with human beings. So they appreciate my lecture. And I think it's fantastic. Moving with all of them. And uh, therefore, my observation in Madurai that speech center will not shift to the opposite side if the problem cause of left handedness is extra cerebral. If it's only cerebral, it will shift. That's the point. That may be useful in the future or may not be, but that's my finding. And of course, uh, Work on neurosyphilis. We found 4% of people with primary syphilis have neurosyphilis in Madurai, whereas it's only less than 2% all over the world, including Africa, Zambia, and so on, where syphilis is rampant. HIV is rampant in Africa. Even they don't have highest syphilis. So Chopra and other top people in our Indian Academy of Neurology started making fun. Here is a syphilis man coming to our conference in Germany, in Switzerland, everywhere where I met them. <laughs> I said, Dr. Chopra, please listen to me. Madurai is a tourist country. India is a unitarian country. <laughs> Unity in diversity is our ambition and achievements. We call all sides of people in our fold. We are there our guests. They spoil us and go. They spoil our people and go. They can't. So Madurai is a tourist center. The local population on the road is only 5%. The tourist population on the road is 90%. So they give us the benefit of their experience and indulgence, and we suffer. <laughs> That's the answer I gave. And then uh, I think the rest of the story is routine publication. I don't think I have anything to say. In coma, I found only one important point, and that was syringing the ear for ocular eye movements in anesthetized patients who recover from anesthesia. And I found the, after they recover from the anesthesia for extracerebral diseases, operation on external, the first thing to recover will be pain, and the last thing to recover is eye movement. And therefore, it confirms the finding that metabolic coma structure, eye movements are paralyzed than pupillary reflexes first, and last to recover. 
and that single point is then up in clinical neurology to identify a metabolic coma rather than structural disease of coma. And uh, that I did in, with, along with the anesthetist in the Madurai Raja Hospital Theatre. Predominant selective paralysis of medial longitudinal bundle by anesthetist. Group of drugs. Simple research. I'm saying this because this research doesn't need a lot of money. I just waited for the surgery to be over in the post operative room. When they remove the tube and they want the patient to be conscious, he doesn't become conscious. I take over. And, uh, you know, there are two types of problems in the theater. One was when the patient dies due to anesthesia, then they don't call you. Some shock or some problem. When he survives, they don't call you because they don't. But when he doesn't survive, when he doesn't die also, he's throwing seizures. They are not able to pull out the tube. They are able to get out home for lunch. They call the neurologist. So I, we have lots of cases like this, lots of experience of treating such cases and making the live, sometimes keeping us in the ward for one full year, rehabilitating them. But the only thing is they lose their cortex a little bit. A 25-year-old boy will become 10-year-old boy intellectually, but he will be doing household work. So it's a lot of experience in smaller hospitals working with, we must work with other specialists. Thank you, sir. So I'll, I, 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 at this point of time, I'd like to run a few slides of your friends. So let's go through them. That's Dr. Balu, uh, the organizer for TANCON conference this time. Yeah, I'll just run them, yeah. So Dr. Balu from Kumbagonam, it's yourself and your most closest friend and uh, your right hand, I must say, though he's standing on the left side, he's your right hand man. First Professor DM, Dr. DRS, first he's DM a teacher student. to all of us. Huh? First DM student in my Our life. teacher. Yes. Yes, sir. And our teacher, I must say. And then, you know, your other students, many of them became HODs and they have retired, actually. And yes, they have, their students have become HODs. I mean, that, that shows, you know, your legacy. And then there's Professor Dr. DRS and your friends. Let me just run these slides and just you can you can give some comments about your friends. So here is, you are attending your lecture a couple of days ago, I think, in Tutukudi. Tutukudi. On, again, this yeah. is on general. This is on the topic that general medicine is more vital to the patient and the doctor than neurology. <laughs> and then Dr. Ganesh and, and, you know, you are several people, I must say. So I'll run them with your slides. And let me hear your comments about your friend. These are, uh, this is our, my colleagues, your students. Uh, so let me just hear about your medical colleagues, sir. A few words about them. No, they were all helpful in improving my knowledge and experience. That's a, that's a basic. <laughs> 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 because they, they, they ask us questions and we have to be ready with answers. Therefore, we get better, uh, not dominate. All of them are like this. Okay, next one. And then our non-medical people, I know he's very close to you, we are aware. And they, these are people who are very close to you. Yes, sir. At least these two people. No, only about, um, um, I've already told about MGR. He, yes, sir. He is a very affectionate man. Very good man, too good for politics. And uh, he suffered uncontrolled diabetes, renal damage, infarction, and so on. And ultimately, he died of myocardial infarction, which is something which all of us forget to remember when it is to be remembered. But you know, diabetes is a silent killer, and myocardial infarction be painless. <laughs> I tell my people, hypertension, we have good medicines, good control, good results, reverse the retinopathy, reverse the nephropathy, reverse everything. But in diabetes, we don't reverse anything. We only keep the property intact, which is not destroyed so far. So I think these are all examples where I had an opportunity to meet with them. And uh, only one thing about MGR, actually, here once he had a shaky fingers, like Parkinson's. It was diagnosed as Parkinson's by some people, but it was not. He had a reason for shaky fingers because it was 
due to diabetes. Severe diabetes, he had severe pain and temperature loss in, below the knee and in the alarm nerve area with resting of the alarm muscles and so on. But, um, however, they, they booked a ticket to Italy. I believe there's a very good neurologist in Italy who is very good in tremors. And uh, some of Dr. B.R. Subramaniam did not like it and phoned up to me and said, why don't you come and see him? I said, sir, why don't you go and see Italy? You have not seen that so far. There's many countries you have seen. Because go with the chief minister, you have the biggest reception and first class accommodation. He said, nonsense, are you going to come or not? Yes, sir, I will come. So we, we, we visited chief minister and I found a significant anemia which was corrected. And this was due to diabetic neuropathy. He had no sensation here. That's because, you know, he had a wrong posture always. Full shirt, but he will lie like this, support on his elbows, and maybe munching his fingers and so on. That completely destroys the learner, which is external. My learner is also totally gone on the left side. So I am only gave him a, a Gamgee pad inside his full shirt and controlled his diabetes for some time, two or three days. I think that made him all right. There was an Italian trip was canceled, but the reason for canceling was because it was sanctioned by the prime minister all the trips and expenses. I don't know how to say it in Tamil English, but it's a, some sort of uh, religious objections to traveling to Italy. But you spoil somebody traveling to Italy, sir. <laughs> yes, sir what about the MAM, sir? sir? You are close uh, with MAM. He's, a, he's one of the unusual persons who is very generous and uh, very rich, fabulously rich and very affectionate and recognizes merit for his, I was at 10 years in our university. Sir, for viewers, sir, for viewers, MAM, sir, is now not, is MAM Ram Swami Swear. So you can tell about him and then tell us. Other viewers across the country may not know him. Hmm? For viewers, MAM, sir, refers to MAM Ram Swami, sir, Sri Ram Swami, sir. So you yeah. can tell that and then you can tell, sir, for viewers no. across the country. Raja, sir, Mutia Chetir was one of the ministers in the cabinet in the earlier Tamil Nadu ministry, and uh, his son is M.A.M. Ram Sami. He was a vice chancellor, pro chancellor of Annamal University, which is one of the best universities. Again, Annamal University is like Rajaji Hospital, where all branches of learning, art, science, sports, culture, marine biology, industry, pharmacology, all in one campus. So if really somebody wants to improve his talents and knowledge and research, that's the place. He need not go anywhere. Unfortunately, even the professor of pharmacology has not seen the experimental laboratory there. That's because we have a narrow-minded in our approach, but broad-minded in our uh, talent, not talents, but in our demands. That's so. Uh, anyway, that's how I, I was that anyway, going there. He is... Um, he brought Dr. Lechner from Lechner from Hungary to Chinambaram and Chennai. And Lechner is a man, he is an authority on hemorrheology. It's a very important topic. Hemorrheology talks about the viscosity of blood and the velocity of blood flow, which is equally important than the narrowing of the blood flow, which we are all treating with, uh, um, with uh, Endo, in, intra, I mean, end, endarterial therapy and so on. <clears throat> you know, uh, endovascular therapy is only at, uh, achieving some uh, remodeling of the narrowing. doesn't do anything about the viscosity. <clears throat> and he said, the cause of viscosity is fibrinogen. And he told, he showed me two cases in Hungary and Budapest, which I visited. Eight cases, coronary bypass surgery by Dennis, by Denton Cooley and Debaki. They could not, after bypass surgery, also walk a few steps in their hotel. He, he uses the fibrinogen diaphoresis, the dialysis in his laboratory, removes the fibrinogen from the blood, and they walk up the hill now. He, he showed me the case. I don't know how long it will last, but somehow it didn't catch through. But 
with uh, to sms please allow me to say this rbc size is 7.2 mu the brain capillary size is 2.2 mu how do you expect 5 million rbcs in a cubic millimeter to go through this 2.2 mu capillary to supply oxygen to your brain for me to talk <laughs> it, needs, it needs a very good behavior of rbcs that is hemorrhagology so i think this is a big subject we cannot go into it but that is neglected now in favor of more uh, uh, glamorous endovascular specialists like here dr sms <laughs> sir uh, let's also hear something about your hobbies so can we have something about your hobbies sir no i was a good player of table tennis and uh, cricket uh, i i have fractured left arm elbow totally damaged by surgeons not by disease but <laughs> doesn't matter but still i have a useful hand god has given me right arm to survive well the left arm is only supportive not dominant for me and that's okay uh, and and uh, i could play table tennis i could play cricket with this no problem and i was the captain of cricket team of sally all the five years and i have played with test cricketers in chennai I even gopinath wickets i have taken i am a fast bowler because he gopinath was a test cricket but they used to play in the chennai first division league first division league has to be cleared before they become eligible for test selection and i was a member of the first division league in those days it's possible to do cricket and medicine also together in table tennis i came up i was a state champion i came up to the top and uh, in the finals i was beaten by john k john who was in from agmore and my my own my, my own relative left hander on k john won the show so i can reach somewhere but not the top and i'm your I, i i we heard that you are still playing table tennis at your home you have a board there yes at 88 yes uh, if i have somebody like uh, dr minard sundaram sms who is worse than me i can play better <laughs> <laughs> so just let me share a photo of uh, you know dr k s sir here allow me to share that photo but because so that's dr k s as a cricket captain so that is his photograph as a cricket captain can you see that photo yeah yeah so that's cricket one so before i let you go sir uh sir it, it has been a sheer pleasure you know hearing you so you can recognize me obviously so i will ask you a question you have been always asking questions to us sir do you know how long you know me sir this will come as a surprise for you i knew you only when you came to madurai after <laughs> and i heard about you in nimans no sir so now i am going to give you this you know secret i kept till you know last i'm going to tell you this sir so i i my 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 mother is a staff nurse she, she retired from government rajaji hospital and in 1970 is when you came back so yes. at that time i was 1 year old and <laughs> i was admitted with some illness in the government hospital as per request of my mother you visited me when i was 1 year old and you blessed me so i was one of those persons who received your blessings as early as at my first year of my age so we have come to the fag end of this wonderful session and here is professor dr k s retired from government service but in no way retired from the neurology community he continues to see cases even today and it is one of his famous quotes with which i'll retire that's you ever wonder why he is so full of knowledge in neurology because he never fails to use it he actively presents cases in our monthly madurai academy of neurology meetings by the way we have this every third friday almost every time he comes with the presentation he is a tough competitor for post graduates in neurology and as recently as couple of days ago he gave a lecture at tutukudi and here is his very famous quote brain use it or lose it so truly lucky are those who had the fortune of being associated with him and how long do i know him sir as i said mention so that's from one year of my sir before we let you go 
what is your final advice to youngsters to our community as a whole as a neurology first thing is i should first place my grateful appreciation of uh, the arrangements of iam and those involved in it and dr ams to be with involved in this and i should as a secretary of the iam and i should thank you for your enormous efforts uh, which i would never have taken myself you have taken all my efforts in your hands and i thank you and then my advice to youngsters is to learn from books lost learn from teacher first and be guided by teachers to learn how to learn from patients and internet is the final solution be a guide and always bless us sir and once again i thank you thank you indian academy of neurology for the opportunity thank you once again let's meet in the next show thank you very much one and all thank you